So absolutely horrendous what happened to Diana. From what I read, I've read in Diana, uh, in her own words, that book. Apparently, uh, Prince Charles was with Camilla the night before he got married to Diana. Do you think that the treatment of Diana played a role in Harry's decision to leave the royals? Yes, I do. And I think, I think well, first of all, uh, the royal family is still incapable of dealing with strong females. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, females should be seen and not heard. They're there to wear the right colour nail varnish uh, to, to cross their legs in public rather than have them splayed and all the other rules which they apply to them. Diana only said, I think, 500 words in public for the first three or four years yeah. because she was not supposed to. I mean, Charles was the one who was there to, to, to take the limelight. She was there to simper and support him. Well, I mean, Diana was a strong woman and with her own mind and... Uh, uh, and very courageous in many ways. I mean, her campaign on landmines, for example, uh, and uh, was 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 um, very effective, annoyed the Americans. And also, of course, remember she was the first major person in the world to to um, shake hands or touch uh, a person with HIV. She changed the world a bit, Diana. So, uh, but of course, th that was not wanted in the royal family. What they wanted was a kind of simpering sidekick for Charles, and she wasn't that. Equally, Meghan is her own woman and has um, a good track record before she met Harry of uh, of involvement. I mean, she wrote to complain to was it NBC, I can't remember who it was now, um, about the um, about one of the adverts on American television, which suggested that only women do uh, the washing up. And she got, she got the thing changed. I mean, this is when she, before she met Harry. So she's a woman of strong opinions uh, and the Royal Family doesn't like women with strong opinions. That's the fact of the matter. So that's that's how you're going to see the Charles and Camilla thing, because what happened with um, uh, Charles is probably no different to what happened with many roles down the years, uh, which is that um, you know go and have a bit of fun, um, and then have a have a have a wife to um, do the proper business out in public, and have a couple of mistresses on the side for a bit of fun. That's how it was. That's how it's always been in the royal family. It hasn't changed, and that's what Charles would have been told by his dad, no doubt. So if the crown goes to Charles and Camilla has this esteemed position then in the country, the fact that Charles was cheating with Camilla and then, you know, what happened to Di, is that always going to be distasteful in the minds of the British public and Charles will never be popular? Well, I mean, Charles's popularity has gone up a bit. Though people regard him as slightly weird and eccentric. Um, and Camilla's has, has also gone up a bit. I mean, remember back when the Diana thing blew up. I mean, they were hugely unpopular, not just uh, Charles and Camilla, but the royal family as a whole was hugely unpopular. Um, and they recovered a bit from that. But Charles was forced to say, and I think he confirmed it in about 2005, it's in my book, that um, Camilla would not be queen. Um, she would be uh, princess consort or some other phrase. I think it was princess consort she was going to be. Well, we've not heard very much about that recently. And I'm quite sure that Charles's intention is to make her queen as and when he accedes to the throne. But, you know, he, he, said, he, he said she wouldn't be. And uh, I think there's a danger there. There's a slight arrogance there again, because the public were very, very fond of Princess Diana. And they were more fond of her than they were of Prince Charles. And uh, it's a difficult transition for him because the queen retains a huge amount of respect in this country uh, for her long reign apart from anything else. And she hasn't by and large uh, made a mess of things um, you know, the same way that say Andrew has. Um, so she's quite well respected and the royal family's respect I think that in the country at large is centred on her. Now when she goes it's by no means certain that um, that respect will transfer automatically to Charles. I mean here we have someone who will be, um, well, it's not his fault but he's, he's 70 something, he's hardly in touch with modern opinion about in a whole range of issues and I don't know if the nation will get terribly excited about a septuagenarian coming to the throne, um, you know, particularly one with um, baggage as Charles, as Charles has. So you need to be quite careful, I think. Is there a possibility they could skip Charles then and just go to the next son? Well, that would be very popular as it happens, or more popular. But no, they would never do that because that would destroy the hereditary principle. Um, the hereditary principle, of course, throws up people who are of all sorts of uh, qualities, good and bad, just like any family does. So you can have someone like 
George V, who was very diligent and, and, and did his best to uh, discharge his duties in a kind of dull but effective way. And then you've got someone like his son, Edward VIII, who was basically a Nazi. So, you know, you don't know who's to be thrown out by, by the hereditary principle. Um, uh, the assumption will always be that the person who inherits is the most appropriate person that happens to be kind of God-given almost. And bear in mind that um, back in 1952, a large percentage of the population thought that the Queen had been put there by God. Now, I don't suppose that would have a chance, but that's what I think it was a third of the population believed at at the time in 1952. Well, you know, that's different from, from now. So, you know, the hereditary principle has always been peddled by the royal family as throwing out the most appropriate person. Uh, well, of course, that's a nonsense. It cannot be that way. And is Charles the most appropriate person? Well, that's for people to say, but um, we're going to get him whether we want him or not, because uh, if you then say, no, we'll have William instead or someone else, then you destroy the whole concept of the, of the hereditary monarchy. Couldn't that concept of the hereditary monarchy be interrupted by parliament having no confidence in the monarch hasn't that happened in the past uh well maybe you're acting back in 1660 or something when you were getting you know, or 1640s when you're beheading charles the first <laughs> but um no i mean not really i mean the fact is that um under our um, peculiar unwritten constitution which is not worth the paper is not written on in, in many regards uh, under that so-called constitution uh, when an MP wins his or her seat democratically in the ballot box, um, they cannot take their seat in Parliament until they've taken an oath to the unelected monarch, not just to the monarch, but to her or his heirs and successors. Um, so you're tied in, and if you don't take the oath, then you're not allowed to take your seat. So here is democracy at work. You win an election, but then you have to take an oath to an unelected person in order to take your seat. You know, we have this ingrained in this country in a way that's deeply unhelpful. And it's not just about monarchy, because the monarchies in the Benelux countries and Scandinavia are really quite different to, to our monarchies. They take those people, the kings and queens over there, they take an oath to the, the parliament, to democracy. You know, we have to take an oath in reverse to the queen. And, um, you know, the, the everybody takes an oath to the queen, even the scouts take an oath to the queen, for heaven's sake. But so do, more importantly, in many ways, the armed forces, because all the top positions in the army and the navy and the air force are occupied by royal members of the royal family. They take a note to the queen personally. Now, that may sound rather esoteric and not very important, but just think back in 1940. If Web VIII hadn't abdicated, and we knew he was a Nazi, he'd been to see Hitler and everything else, if he hadn't abdicated and he wanted appeasement, because he did, at that point, and he advocated appeasement. Suppose he is king in 1940, had said to the armed forces, lay down your weapons. What would he have done? They take it out to him personally. So we have to get rid of this nonsense in this country. We have to instill democratic values and democratic processes, and the royal family is a blockage to those. So the only way we're going to get rid of Charles then is if he's sympathizing with the enemy. Well, I mean, Charles has said. Um, that he wants to slim down the, the royal family, which if, if he does that, that's a good thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, he's already, you get rid of the balcony. On the front, front of my book, I always show this when I do interviews. <laughs> yeah, cover there. There's, I think, 44 of them, 43, 44 of them on the balcony. What are they all doing? Why have we got all these people on the balcony? What, who are they? We don't need all these people. Um, you know, if you want a monarchy, you have what they have in other countries, which is you have the king and the queen and put the two together. Then you have the heir and, and, and his or her partner. And then the, the next generation down. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. <laughs>